I need to start this video out with a trigger warning. The speed paint that follows has graphic depictions of blood, gore, and self-harm. If you are sensitive to any of these subjects, I strongly recommend you click on another video. Thank you, and please stay safe. Hello, mes amis! It's Wow I Wish I Could Draw, and we're back with another speed paint. Today we're going to be talking about Basler's character development over the course of the campaign. A whole lot has changed, and I just wanted to talk about it, because I initially didn't intend Baslar to be a compelling character. He was just gonna be like, one note, kind of a jerk. Maybe the most character development he would get is that he would hate his friends less. <laughs> but now he's trapped in a pact, and that's driving him insane, and he can't get out. So let's talk about what happened. Baslar's backstory isn't terribly complex. He got kicked out of his lizard folk tribe in the Basiria Swamp for just being too weak and scrawny to defend himself. He would have starved to death somewhere out in the wilderness if Tanager hadn't found him and saved his life. When he made a deal with Basthar, Basthar finally had something that made him strong or unique. He could finally defend himself, but the problem was he didn't earn it on his own merit. The only way to keep the magic was to do things for Tanager. So that's when the campaign started, Baslar being relatively new to Warlock Hood, traveling around and having adventures with people he didn't really know or necessarily care about. At least for the moment, that is. Throughout the course of farm or spider adventures or even political sabotage, Baslar got very attached to his companions. He'd never had anyone care about his well-being at all, really. And so he lied and hid the fact that he was a warlock because he didn't want to be cast out of this group of people he had found himself with. Even when we were performing political sabotage and revolution, Basler didn't necessarily care what was going on. He just wanted his friends to be safe. And so naturally, they weren't. We've had two player character deaths, one of them being a halfling sorcerer named Jal and a halfling monk named Milo. I want you to remember that halfling Milo is a thing because I'm going to be talking about a different Milo in a little bit, so just keep that in mind. In both of the character deaths, Basthar was running or hiding instead of defending his friends. To be fair, there's only so much you can do when you have six strength and two spell slots. But to avoid dying himself, Basthar had to use Tanager's teleportation magic to get himself out of there. It hasn't really come up in game, but Basthar is still very, very guilty about what happened. The player who was formerly Jal created a halfling artificer. His name is Des. Of course he's going to remind Basthar of the friends he so unfortunately lost. I hope we're starting to see the recurring theme of Basthar wanting to do something or wanting to help, but either not being strong enough or not even having the magical capabilities to. This lack of agency or lack of control is very relevant because we're going to talk about the next Milo now. The next Milo is a tabaxi pirate who's also a Hexblade warlock. He was essentially just a cameo, but he unintentionally represented everything Basthar wanted to be at the time. He wanted to be confident, independent, strong, in control of his life, or even in control of his relationship with his patron. Milo was free to make his own decisions and be as shitty of a person as he wanted to, I guess. So at this point, Basthar has two main motivations. He wants to keep his powers and grow stronger, but he also wants to be around his friends and not make a bad impression on them. And so, when Tenegar contacted Basthar and said he needed to get over to Balbond immediately and fix his problems, Basthar had to really suspiciously drag everyone across the ocean to Balbond. I made up this very grand, elaborate lie that I was actually a mountain druid, and we needed to go to the mountain because it was under attack from some implicitly evil force that certainly wasn't a demon inside the mountain. What are you talking about? And so, that's the lead up to Tenegar dropping Basthar taking away his powers, and the start of the Mind Electric animatic, I guess. I didn't depict it in the animatic, but Des was able to talk to Tanager and convince him that the both of us were useful to him, that we could complete the tasks I had been neglecting. After a nat 20 in persuasion, the two of us were sent out of the mountain to go complete my tasks. And so we immediately didn't. Basthar was contacted by a different demon named Nelpis. This is very important, because this is the one moment in Basthar's entire life where he had real, genuine agency. He alone had the power to decide Tanager's fate. And so, after so recently being scorned, Basthar told Melpis everything he knew about Tanager, All his weaknesses, all the ways into the mountain, everything. Melpis offered to be Basthar's new patron in return, but Basthar declined. He had decided, this is it. This is the point where I create my own life, where I don't have a demon watching over me, where I can just do whatever I like. 
and this this is a paramount change in his character. This is where things got intense, where things got real, where Baslar was just allowed to change and grow. And so, Des, Baslar, and the rest of the party all went to the capital of Belbond. We wanted to speak with their leader, and he's called the God King, and it's really weird. And so we got there, and we were waiting in this big, enormous library. Baslar wandered off to find something to eat, but instead he found a Yuan Ti woman. She was staring directly at him, and he tried to ignore her, but that's when he started to have severe hallucinations. It was like the walls were closing in on him, like the whole world was turning, everything was wrong, and he couldn't stop it. Bastar had fallen to the ground and was curling up into a ball, trying not to be hit by the imaginary bookshelves that were going to crush him. But then very quickly, everything turned back to normal. The yuan Ti woman approached Bastar, and she gave him a small amethyst crystal. The only thing she said to Bastar was, We'll be seeing each other soon, and I'm sorry. She left, and Baslar was able to run away and regroup with the rest of his party. We met with the God King, and Baslar told him everything he had told Nelpis. As a reward for such vital information, the God King granted all of us a wish. Anything we wanted, he would grant it. Des asked for his own alchemy shop, and also a certification to prove that he was a master in his chosen craft. Instead of anything useful like that, Baslar just asked for new clothes. He was tired of the green cloak that reminded him of his former patron. He got elaborate cloaks and jackets, and they were purple, as a reminder of his newfound independence. Still on the high of meeting the God King of Belbond, Des and Bazthar made their way into a very fancy inn in the capital. And wouldn't it be nice if it ended there? If this was a happy story about Bazthar's redemption and his escape from warlockhood? How he was free to be his own person, stay, stay around his friends, work in an alchemy shop, play instruments, do anything he wanted. But it's not. That was when Bazthar's nightmares began. When he was forced to relive all the times in his life where he was just useless. Being too weak to even get food, nearly starving to death, cowering in the face of danger or abandoning his friends, lying to them. He remembered that all he could ever do is rely on others for strength. He's just a burden to the people he cares about. That's what the voice in his head said, the voice that seemed so real it had to be. Eyes, everywhere, always watching, they can see all his mistakes. They know the truth, they know what he really is. Be them, be my eyes, look around, watch and then wake up. Next to Bazlar was a long metal staff topped with a cluster of amethyst crystals. There was tangled metal keeping it in place. It was watching him. Always. And that was how Bazlar was dragged back into Warlock Hood against his will. And that's pretty much where we are now in the campaign. We've got two new player characters. We've got a human grave cleric and a kobold druid. Uh, the player who was formerly Halfling Milo is now a half-orc paladin, who's also a demon hunter. <laughs> the point is, this is a pivotal moment in Baslar's character. He is at his lowest right now. And the ways that I can further progress his character is seeing how he changes from this. I thought of a few ways that I can take his character, and I know it's bad to plan ahead in D&D because things rarely go how you want them to, but it's still fun to imagine, I guess. Probably the most narratively satisfying would be to have Vazthar become a fully good person. Uh, like, despite his warlock hood, he still goes out of his way to protect people and prevent them from falling into the same situation he was in. A plausible but less satisfying ending is if Vazthar becomes like Milo. Pirate Milo, I mean, not halfling. I imagine that after years of being weak or being under someone's thumb, Vazthar decides the only agency he can have in this situation is to make others weaker than he is. So maybe he ruins lives just to make himself feel strong. That's still in character, but it's not quite as satisfying. But the ending for Bazthar's character arc that I think is most likely is that he just ends up losing his mind completely. He's supposed to be his patron's eyes, so what if in a fit of desperation he thinks the only way to make the vision stop is to just carve eyes into himself? What if that's not enough? What if to show his loyalty to his patron, 
he just takes his own eyes out. It's not just that this is extreme body horror for the sake of being shocking, it's that Baslar becomes everything he was scared to be, in which every part of him, his mind, his body, his soul, belongs to someone else. He literally cannot function without their strength. And that sounds pretty sad to me. I think that about covers everything, I think. I hope you guys have enjoyed this in-depth look at Baslar's character, his backstory, all the events that have kind of led up to his very unfortunate situation. I think I'll just take a minute or two to answer a couple popular questions I got on the last video, just for the sake of general knowledge, I guess. In case it wasn't immediately clear, Baslar is neither a kobold nor a dragonborn, he's actually a lizard folk. In earlier designs, his pseudo-horns, I guess, were a lot less defined, but after drawing him so many times, they just kind of turned out that way, and <laughs> it's pretty confusing. In terms of Baslar's current patron, I wanted to keep them as vague as I possibly could. When I first, I guess, came up with them, they had a name and they had a physical form, and I thought that depicting that in an animatic would make them a lot less scary and ominous. They want Baslar to carry around the staff, scatter amethyst crystals, and all that fun stuff because it allows them to see into his plane of existence and just observe what's going on. Also, just like Tanager, they're technically fiend. I know that kind of depicting them as oops all eyes makes them seem like it's packed of the great old ones, but that's not really the case. I would have gone that way with the new patron, but I just didn't want to give up the trash fire lizard aesthetic that I had going on. I think those were at least the most frequent questions I got. I hope it clarifies things. If you have further questions, feel free to write me a comment. I try to respond as frequently as I can. Also, if you have suggestions for what kinds of videos you want to see in the future, I also appreciate that. I have a lot of ideas at the moment. I want to make more Baslar animatics, but I just want some more things to happen in canon before I get ahead of myself. If you're wondering about Calamit and Song from Tales from Eurosa, um, we kind of just wrapped up the first major arc of the campaign, and so much shit happened, it was off the walls. Um, I think one of my next videos will be covering what happened there. This, it'll probably be another speed paint with me talking over it, I guess. But I've got other ideas. I want to do a video where I show you all the voices I have for my characters, including maybe other impressions I can do? I don't know! I don't have a lot of experience with voice acting, but you know, videos like this definitely help! Because looking back at all the stuff I recorded, the pacing is kind of weird, I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, it's awkward, I guess, but I'm getting better! I'm definitely getting better! I can say that. But anyways, I've wasted enough of your time, so goodbye, I appreciate and love every single one of you, and just thank you for all the feedback I'm getting. It, it really means a lot to me. Alright, goodbye.